Lincoln Cathedral is hardly as well known to the general public as Canterbury or York Minster, but it's arguably more important architecturally. It can be seen as the place where the national style of the 13th century, what we now call Early English Gothic, was forged. Unlike Canterbury, which in many aspects remained very French, Lincoln took the opportunity of a disaster to go totally off the rails and do some very new things. But of course, when you're spitballing, some things are occasionally going to go a bit wrong. Before the Norman Conquest, the bishop's seat was in Dorchester in Oxfordshire, but the new imperialistic Norman rulers wanted their cathedrals in Roman towns rather than rural backwaters. In the 1070s, a Romanesque cathedral, uniquely with a fortified west block resembling a Roman triumphal arch, rose in Lincoln under the reign of its first bishop, Remigius. In the mid-12th century, under Bishop Alexander, this western block received a pair of towers that brought it much closer to its appearance today. And also the cathedral was retrofitted with some ambitious stone-high vaults, probably in the manner of Durham Cathedral. Ambitious indeed, because in 1185 it seems that an earth tremor caused part of those new vaults to fall down. <laughs> Because, not surprisingly, putting a stone ceiling on a building not built from the ground up with a mind to supporting them is a pretty dangerous idea if you're not quite sure what you're doing. Nevertheless, at Lincoln, they took this disaster as an opportunity to start anew with one of the most ambitious and complex buildings of the European Gothic Age. Now, when you experience the east end of the cathedral today, it's pretty straightforward. From the central tower, with its pair of transepts, you have the straight choir, then a second pair of smaller transepts, and then a big flat east end. However, this east end was added much later, and obscures the complexity of what was planned and partially built under Bishop Hugh of Avalon in the 1190s. Bishop Hugh, later Saint Hugh the Swan Botherer, originally would have been on a committee that decided on a weird wedge-shaped apse with a series of chapels radiating off it, flanked by two transeptal steeples. Yes, they originally did plan to have towers and presumably spires on top of these transepts. You can clearly see the wonky change of plan when the thick tower buttresses change to slimmer ones. Inside, the north transept still has its low vault for the belfry stage to go, and on the other side you can see where a similar vault was either planned or removed due to a certain incident that really made Lincoln think about its health and safety record. We'll come to that shortly. Inside, what survives of St Hugh's Choir is weird and wonderful. They can't quite seem to decide on a shape to put in the gallery spandrels, but they certainly have the impetus to put something there, so they just experiment. Sometimes with better results than others. This addiction to space filling can be seen in the clerestory, with these absurdly tiny arches flanking the windows. This is the sort of thing that might have worked with round arches, but with pointed ones it does look pretty daft. But they're just working things out. They're experimenting. The most famous eccentricity at Lincoln, however, is the so-called crazy vaulting. <coughs> the name was first coined by the German art historian Paul Frankl in the 1950s, and the crazy vault has perplexed art historians how something so early can look as wacky as the advanced things that were done with late Gothic in the 15th and 16th century. Now, for art historians obsessed with formal designs such as Frankel, usually the crazy vault is explained, along with its pioneering ridge rib down the middle, by the English trend for horizontality rather than French verticality. I just made this dope new website. Let me show you how I did it. Bonjour, mon pétifilou. As you might be able to tell by that outrageous accent, I am from France, and I am here to tell you stupid English that if you just laid your vault properly so that the masonry matched up at the ridge, you wouldn't need to cover it up with stupid things like ridge ribs and urge buses. Ugh, why can't you be more like La Belle Chart? <sighs> I'm glad you people are leaving the common market. Do you like money? Do you like sports? Do you often find yourself speculating on the outcome of sporting events? Then you'll love gambling! But rather than national attitudes to pattern and all that sort of thing, I think the crazy vaults can be explained better 
by the idea of an English mason experimenting with the limits of new technology he'd learnt of from France, but not bound in the same way by received convention as he would be there. Because it's not just crazy for the sake of it. It's clever. Let's examine a bay. Each single bay is spanned by two interlocking Y-shapes. Now, the general French approach to vaulting this would have been to put a sexpartite vault over two bays, so you can see our bay is now split into three. But this makes the cells so large that it's really asking for trouble, and nobody wants risking another collapse. Sexpartite over each single bay is how the vault runs in the eastern transepts and the last bay before the tower. But the difference in both of these bays is that those two extra ribs go straight through where in the choir the largest clerestory window is. And windows were clearly very important to this design. Using vanilla quadripartite would have been an option, but the cells of the vault would probably have come down too low for the tall central window of the clerestory. So the so-called crazy vault allows for steeper pockets over the clerestory and is stiffened by the parallelogram in the middle. It's essentially quadripartite, but it's just jiggled around a bit to allow for bigger windows. It really is genius. But even if the master mason who came up with the big ideas in Lincoln Choir was clearly on top of his game when it came to French Gothic technology and engineering, his Lincolnship workforce are perhaps why some of it is a bit rough around the edges in execution. This is not going to work. Why didn't you say so before? I did say so before. Now, one of the most glorious holes that the builders of Lincoln Choir dig themselves into is this great wheeze they have of syncopating the dado arcading. Now, as you walk around Lincoln Choir, you'll see that there are two layers of arches, one a beat behind the other, syncopated, like reggae or something. Give us a break! The problem is, when they get to the end of the wall, they're never really sure what the hell to do. First they just put squashed up arches. Which looks kind of awkward. Um, can we have some more reggae please, Axel? Give us a reggae! Thank you. Then they try putting the full arch behind, but they still don't really quite leave enough room. Give us a reggae! Cheers. Then when they start building the new main transepts, just as they seem to start to get the hang of the syncopated arcading, it abruptly stops. Forever. Why? Well, it's time for that... incident. It seems that the tower that they had just built... fell down. Well, we don't know the extent of what happened, or even the exact date. It may have been 1237 or 1239. But my hypothetical drawing here envisages that what they did was raise up an existing Romanesque crossing with a belfry stage and a lead-covered spire before they actually completed the new Gothic transepts. And when they remove the Romanesque transept west wall, the southwest pier has collapsed, taking the two adjacent bays with it because there are essentially two ways that central towers can collapse. The first is that one pier completely goes, brings down two sides of the tower, but manages to leave the other corner and the other two sides standing, such as happened at Ripon. This will certainly destroy all four bays directly connected to the pier, but can also cause a bit of a domino effect. The east arcade of the south transept and part of the choir toppled at Ripon. But it's not a hopeless situation to be able to rescue most of the building. The other way for a crossing tower to go is if the other piers are weak enough to give way and collapse at the same time as the weakest one goes. By far the best documented example for this is Chichester steeple, which collapsed in the mid-19th century and caused a hell of a mess, including the four crossing arches, 12 whole bays were destroyed and had to be totally rebuilt that's 50% more damage than was caused by the tower toppling over at Ripon. How the Middle Ages dealt with a telescope can be best seen at Ely, where they just responded to the catastrophe by saying sod it, and cutting off the corners of the crossing to form the famous octagon. So a telescope is hardly a neat little boo-boo that you can just sweep up. The destruction is massive. 
So I don't think Lincoln's Tower could have telescoped, as St Hugh's 1190s choir is clearly largely unharmed. So let's have a closer look at the main transepts and how they were remodelled around the tower collapse. The east walls of the transepts adjacent to the tower at Lincoln don't seem to have completely rebuilt, as much as partly dismantled and strengthened. Everything within this red line has been rebuilt and beefed up a bit for a second go at the tower. And you can see here the slipped arches suggest that they've been reconstructed rather than built completely brand new, and actually are a bit concerning. They went back into St Hugh's choir and started really freaking out about how slender the piers were, so beefed up the gallery openings and encased some of the arcade piers in these rather utilitarian cylinders with only a sliver of a Purbeck capital on the top. When the mouldings didn't match up on the new ribs, they just um, put some stuff on it. Uh, yeah, we don't need those anymore. Just cover it up with some leaves. In fact, covering up your minor cock-ups with leaves <coughs> became a bit of a leitmotif around Lincoln, and eventually it was a tool in the arsenal of every English Gothic mason. It was particularly useful for covering up how the reinforced crossing tower no longer fitted very well with the plan of the transepts, and the vaults going all wonky at the end. If we assume, as in my drawing, that they were originally planning to keep the Romanesque nave before a bloody great steeple fell on it, some changes would have to be made to the design of the west wall of the transepts, to allow for a larger Gothic nave. Now the place where you should always look in a cathedral for mistakes, and that's the northwest corner of the crossing, at Lincoln you can see a change of plan here. It has one normal bay of four dado arches and two lancets, and then one bay built up of one half wide and one half thin, which is kind of pointless because it makes it the same total width in the end. But the thin half might be a change of plan from when they were going to make this bay wider to reach the Romanesque aisle wall. And a bit of fudging was also needed to start the brand new North Isle. But the thing is with churches, you always get another go at getting it right on the other side. The collapse of that tower brings about a whole change of mindset at Lincoln, and the Masons were clearly told to cut the crap with all the syncopation and just finish the building before anything else falls down. After the North Isle, the design of the South Isle even ditches the clever clog's idea of having an arch behind the vaulting shaft, and with its ordinary trefoils with a dog tooth trim, it's a distillation of all the best bits that went on in the laboratory of St Hugh's Choir, and it became a paragon for church architecture across England for the next half century. The high vault is inspired by the crazy vault in how it allows for a tall clerestory, but in an altogether more orderly manner. It puts out two mini ribs from the central boss for the cross ribs to spring a smaller and therefore steeper space. These mini ribs, which we call liernes, would be extremely important in decorative late Gothic, as would these additional ribs we call tiercerans between the transverse and cross ribs. Lierne, tiercerin. Write that down in your copybook now. OK, there is one last pretty gigantic mistake in the church. Possibly because they didn't initially think they were going to keep the Norman West block, they didn't bother thinking about the angle that they were setting out the nave. Now first you need to ignore this strainer arch, which is 19th century, because when the arcades hit the west front, there's way more space on the south than on the north, which leads to this quite hilarious mismatch of arch widths. In fact, there's hardly any room on the north to get the detailing in at all. <laughs> now, with the roofing of the nave and the west front in hand, the dean and chapter really did fancy their own cloister and chapter house, even though they weren't monks and didn't really need them. The chapter house was ambitiously stone vaulted with a slender column in the centre, which ended up necessitating these quite extraordinary flyers propping it up around the outside, which I'm not entirely convinced were part of the original design. Make up your own mind. Now, not to be outdone by his chapter, on the bishop's side of the cathedral, next to his palace, some bishop decided to whack on a gigantic porch to the south transept. The problem is, as far as consistency of design goes, it's utter bobbins. I don't think I need to explain any of this. Or if I can... 
but essentially nothing is straight and nothing fits anywhere. It's really quite extraordinary how shit it all is. The Angel Choir was part of a phenomenon of cathedrals expanding their east ends into a grander setting for their saint shrine. In Lincoln's case, this was Saint Hugh. It might seem a bit of a weird tribute to tear down part of his building to do this, but no matter. No expense was spared. The whole arm outdoes the recently completed east end of Ely Cathedral by adding the technology of French bar tracery. The Angel Choir takes its name from the statuary in the Spandrels, one of the best preserved collections of 13th century English sculpture. These sculptors were clearly really into angels, because Christ and the Virgin do look a little bit odd, and no one told them that King David does not have wings. The vault which soars over the Angel Choir is a further simplification of Lincoln's vaulting tradition, which became very influential. It is essentially the nave vaults with the Leurnes taken out, probably because the bays are narrower and they were thought unnecessary. It has a kind of palm tree effect, something that would become very common in English architecture, such as at Exeter, Westminster Abbey's nave, and perhaps even Tudor fan vaulting. Next to the crazy vaults of 70 years before, it makes you wonder why they didn't just do them like this in the first place. Well, technology is clearly improved. Look how the masonry is carefully laid so it leads neatly up to the ridges. Mon dieu, c'est en français! It, but it also wasn't the way that the early Gothic mind worked. They were feeling their way in the darkness towards the light. But they also did care if sometimes they did things that were a little silly. <laughs> to Johnny Alliday. Oh well. Off to work.